audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. What is the one thing, the overriding thing, the overarching thing that I'm petitioning the Lord for, that I'm crying to the Lord for? You answer that to yourself, not to anybody else. And then depending on what it is, ask yourself a second question. If the Lord answers my prayers and gives me exactly what I've been praying for, would I be willing to offer that very prayer answered back to Him? Would I be willing to do that? Dr. Michael Youssef, posing questions you should consider on this episode of Leading the Way. Coming up, Dr. Youssef takes you to a tough time for Hannah, a woman begging God through the pain of her infertility for a child. Her prayer reveals five qualities that can invigorate your prayers. It's a part of his series, Life-Changing Prayers. Here's Dr. Yusuf to begin. We saw in the last message how this wonderful, gracious woman, Hannah, won her victory on the knees of prayer. As she prayed, she made God a vow. She made God a promise. And I told you in the last message, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you have every intention of keeping the vow, the promise you make to the Lord, because God cannot be mocked. Her vow was simply this, Lord, if you give me a son, that's the most desperate need that I have. If you give me a son, I will give him back to you. I'll dedicate him to you. And she totally and completely and without hesitation and without qualification, she kept her promise. And she took the boy Samuel to the temple. And her son, the prophet Samuel, not only blessed her, he blessed the whole world. (laughs) And today, I want you to look closely to Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2. There are five things here that immediately you see in this woman's life. And they all begin with S to help you remember them, okay? It's surrender, sorrow, supplication, song, and sacrifice. Can you say them fast? (laughs) Let's say them together. Surrender, sorrow, supplication, song, and sacrifice. First, when she prayed, she prayed the prayer of surrender. Total surrender, complete surrender. Not partial, not qualified surrender. She handed ownership of her life totally to the Lord. She handed the deeds of her life over to the Lord in complete surrender. I think you have to agree that most of us, when we talk about surrender, we're talking about surrender some things to God, right? Just uh, certain areas uh, where we need help, but not every area. We kind of do partial surrender uh, stuff. When we surrender our business, we want to surrender those parts in the business that are not doing very well so that God can fix them and turn them around, right? That's what we do. When we surrender our families, (laughs) we want the Lord to take over the problem child. (laughs) We'll take care of the good ones, you know. When we surrender our finances, we want to give the Lord (laughs) the losing part of our portfolio. (laughs) Most people, when they come under financial stress, they begin cutting their budget. You know what the first thing goes? The tithe and the offerings. They're like killing the goose that lays a golden egg. (laughs) It's amazing to me how we cut the very thing, the very source of supply for all of life. (laughs) But when Hannah surrendered, she gave the Lord the best that she has, the best thing that she has, not the leftover. (laughs) When she surrendered, Uh, She surrendered the most important thing in her life, not the crumbs. When she surrendered, she gave herself first, and then what treasured the most? She gave back to the Lord the very thing (laughs) that she prayed for, the very thing. And so first, there was a surrender. Second, there is a sorrow. You see, Hannah's surrender to the Lord did not spare her the sorrow and the pain that came from Penina's taunting and mocking and ridiculing her. Beloved, please listen to me very carefully here, because I think as you read the story, you will realize that Hannah had a house, but she did not have a home. She may have had a home, but she did not have a haven of rest. 
She may have had a caring husband, but she also had Panina's sharp tongue. She lived with constant cruelty. She lived with perpetual taunting. She lived with fretting over her predicament. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 15, listen to what she called herself. She called herself a woman of sorrowful spirit. Some of you may be putting on the church mask, but you have a sorrowful spirit. I want to minister to you through the Word of God. Because Hannah, even in the midst of her sorrow, she trusted the Lord. Even when her womb was shut, her heart was open to the Lord. Even where her anguish was unbearable, she learned (laughs) to lean on God. Some of you here may feel that your rivers are running dry. I want you to remember that God's oceans are not. Uh, Some of you may feel that your star is hidden from view. They are not hidden from His view. Some of you young moms may feel that you are knee in diapers <laughs> and that you'll never get over this and your feelings, your self-worth is so low. Remember, you are worth more than rubies and sapphire to the one who matters the most. Some of you may feel that you've experienced financial losses. I want to remind you what you have. You have possessions that are not fading. You have promises of God that are and will be fulfilled. You have power that cannot be defeated. You have a protector who's unchanging. You have a provider who is limitless. Hannah's surrender and Hannah's sorrow, which led to Hannah's supplication. Those are connected. These are not just nice words all begin with S so you can remember them. They really are. They're all connected. You see, her sorrowful heart did not make of her a bitter person. Be very careful with bitterness. So the Bible talks about bitterness as the root of bitterness. You see, he didn't say the fruit of bitterness because if it's a fruit is on top of the tree and you can see it. The reason bitterness is very dangerous is because it's a root. It's deep down. It's not easily seen. It's not easily viewed. And it builds up, and it builds up, and it builds up. And if you don't surrender to the Lord moment by moment, day by day, you will wake up one day feeling a bitter, to be a bitter person. And may the Lord deliver us from bitterness. This woman, Hannah, this gracious woman, have been emotionally hurt but her soul was healed. She had been emotionally battered, but her commitment to the Lord was unshakable. She may have been physically exhausted, but spiritually she was powerful. She may have had every reason to give up, but she persisted in prayer. You see, surrender and supplications are connected with each other. Well, let me ask you, what is she praying for? What was her petition? I know most of you are going to say, to have a son. It's really more than that. Her prayer was far more than that. Listen carefully. She was praying for God to intervene with the laws of nature. I want to tell you something. This is me, not the Bible, okay? And I always make sure you understand. (laughs) As society and many people in our society unite together groups like the atheists and the humanists and the Muslims and the militants, and all these groups unite on being belligerent against the name of Jesus. The more we see the name of Jesus under attack, which I personally don't think that's a bad thing, to be quite honest. I'm telling you. I think it's wonderful. It's going to wake up the practical atheists who are sitting in the pews. It's going to purify the church of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a time whether we're going to put up or shut up. But I'm also convinced that as the name of Jesus and God's children come under attack, we're going to see the supernatural power of God working in the faithful believers like we have never seen in our lifetimes. Amen. Amen. I think God says, okay, you want to live by sight like the rest of the people of the world? That's fine. Go for it. You want to see my hand working? You won't see supernatural intervention, and that's not what we want. Amen. Amen. 
Hannah's supplication was in the context of her surrender. It wasn't just an isolated thing. Well, oh, Lord, give me this, and Lord, do this. And do. No, no, no. It was in the context of her surrender. Those two are, are related. You see, there are all sorts of people who pray for all sorts of things. And sometimes when I hear people in the media talk, oh, yeah, they are in our prayers, and I wonder who they're talking about. What kind of prayers are they talking about? Who, who are they praying to? But, but, you know, it's just a kind of a social thing we say. All sorts of people pray for all sorts of things. Even unbelievers, when they're in trouble, they pray. They don't know what they're praying, who they're praying to, but they pray anyway. <laughs> but they will never understand surrender. They will never understand what it means to abandon oneself to Christ alone. And Hannah's, in her case, her petition, her supplication, was in the context of her surrender. The two have gone together. In her case, because of her surrender, <laughs> that her chain of sorrow were torn asunder by her supplication. And those chains were replaced by a joyful song. Which brings me to the fourth thing you see here, song. Look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. It's an incredible, magnificent song. By the way, this is exactly, in, yeah, I mean, almost word for word, not quite, as the Virgin Mary's song, when she was told that she's pregnant as a virgin with the Son of God, the Messiah. She burst into a prayer and a song, and it was, we call the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. And you see, little girls back then, little Hebrew girls, were memorizing Hannah's song. And if you put the two together, they're very close. She was reciting Hannah's song. In fact, Hannah's song really fulfilled in the Virgin Mary, but I'm going to talk about that in the next message. Hannah immediately began to sing praises to the Lord. That is her song. But there's something else here I don't want you to miss, okay? Because most of us praise God for something. We praise Him for salvation. We praise Him for His blessings. We praise Him for His kindness. We praise Him when He answers prayer. We praise Him for this, and we praise Him for the other thing. There are very few people who know how to praise God for His holiness. See, everybody can sing. She was praising Him. It takes a surrendered person to praise God for His holiness. It takes standing on a higher spiritual plane to praise God for His holiness. And Hannah said, there is no rock like the Lord. There is no one holy like the Lord. What does it mean? It means that in Him there is all of her security. Her security was not in money, it was not in friends, it was not even in a caring husband. <laughs> Her security was in the one whose stability is unshakable, whose comfort is incomparable, whose power is unconquerable, whose love is unchangeable, whose compassion is inexhaustible, whose shield is imperitable, and whose peace is unexplainable. In verse 1, she said, my horn is exalted in the Lord. First, let me tell you what she's not saying. She's not saying that I am full of pride. Why am I saying this? Because horns in the Bible can mean pride, uh, can mean power. And it's an imagery that the Bible uses that comes from the ox. You know, the ox is power. And pride is in his horn. And Hannah is saying that all of my strength is in the Lord, not in my success. All of my power, all of my joy comes from the Lord Himself, not even from the fact that He answered my prayers. Amen. Beloved, listen to me. God will always give a song of praise to a surrendered life of supplication. He really will. As you're waiting upon the Lord, He's going to give you a song. Uh, he will always give you a song to your heart and to your lips. He'll give you a song when you're sold out to Jesus in prayer. Let me tell you about God's song. 
God's song is a power to the powerless. God's song is a strength to the weak. God's song is a joy to the joyless. God's song is a healing to the soul. God's song is a victory to the defeated. God's song is a sacrifice unto the Lord. And that is why the Bible speaks about the sacrifice of praise. It doesn't talk about singing. See, a lot of people go to church and they try to sing. They go to a ball game, they scream their heads off. Come to church, well, they sing. That is not the sacrifice of praise. Let me tell you the difference. That's the fifth thing that I want to talk about here in this wonderful woman's prayer. First, we saw surrender, sorrow, supplication, song, sacrifice. In the last message, I shared with you briefly how Hannah made a vow to the Lord. The Lord, if you answer my prayer and you give me a son, I will dedicate him to you. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we see her keeping her vow. She kept her promise totally, completely, without hesitation, without qualifications, without explanations. (laughs) I want you to listen very carefully, please, because this is important. (laughs) Because more than anything in the world, What did Hannah want the Lord to give her? A son, right? And when God gave her that son, she gave him right back to the Lord. Just like she promised. I want you to ask yourself two questions. It's the second one, depending on how you answer the first, okay? And this is between you and God, in the privacy of your heart, when you're all alone with God. Ask yourself the first question. What is the one thing, the overriding thing, the overarching thing that I'm petitioning the Lord for, that I'm crying to the Lord? What's the one thing? I'm sure there are a lot of other things that we're asking the Lord for, and I I pray for lots of people and lots of things. But what is the one thing, that overall thing, that really is the burden of your heart that you are crying to the Lord for? You answer that to yourself, not to anybody else. And then, depending on what it is, ask yourself a second question. If the Lord answers my prayers and gives me exactly what I've been praying for, would I be willing to offer that very prayer, answer to prayer, back to Him? Would I be willing to do that? God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, son of promise. He tried to improve on the will of God and got Ishmael and got us all into trouble. But God said, it's Isaac. And then... 17 years later, he said, okay, take Isaac, offer him to me. Wait a minute. You gave him to me. (laughs) He's supernaturally born from a 90-year-old woman. And how come? Hannah prayed all, give me, he gives her a son. She takes him to the temple. It's all yours, Lord. Why? Does God need to take back what he already given you? Is is a God an Indian giver? No, beloved, listen. He doesn't, if he gave it, he gave it to you, he can give you a whole lot more. It doesn't matter. God has infinite resources. He doesn't want it. He wants to be sure that you are holding it with open palms, with open hands. Not grabbing it, this is mine, and I'm not going to do this. This is mine. Nobody's going to touch this. Yeah. See, that's the thing about Hannah that makes her such a, a wonderful woman of God. She could have backtracked. She could have said, well, I'm going to wait until Samuel become a man. Then I'm going to, you know, he can make up his mind and he decide and I'll give him to the Lord. Uh, she did not backtrack on her promise. She did not redefine what give is, you know, the games we play in our heads. Or should we tithe before the taxes or after taxes? Should we really just give 10% or give offering on top? Should we really try? How much? You know, and all those games we play in our heads, she did none of that. Hannah did not try to use human gibberish like we try to. She did not try to rationalize it in her head. But indeed, she could have said, Oh, Lord, you know, I need him to comfort me in my old age, surely. Lord, I just need to do this first, and I need to do that second, and then I need to do that and other thing. And no. She said, I give him back to the Lord as a boy to minister in the temple. And look at what happened. Look at what happened. Samuel 
was not only such a great blessing to her, <laughs> he was a blessing to millions of people. She dedicated that boy to the Lord at a very early age. And what a sacrifice. For this man, Samuel, changed history. This man, Samuel, turned the people of God's hearts back to God. This man, Samuel, anointed the head of King David, who's the ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to say more. But listen, if this was the end of the story, that would have been incredible. That would have been fantastic. That would have been just wonderful. What an incredible answer to prayer. If that was the end of the story, it would have been wonderful. But there's more to come. There's more to come. God responded to Hannah's faithfulness and sacrifice by giving her a bunch more kids. <laughs> she talks about seven, obviously. Either give her six more or seven more, or at least she got a whole bunch of them. Listen carefully, because this is important. When she kept her vow to the Lord and took Samuel to the temple, she did not anticipate the Lord is going to give her any more children. And there's no evidence that she ever prayed for any more. But you see, that's how God works. This is the way He works. When He sees a glimpse of faithfulness, He blesses more and more. God longs to bless His children. He really does. He's longing to be a source of limitless supply of blessings for His children. She did not know she's going to get all that. But that's how our God works. This is how our Lord works. That's the way He responds to the sacrifice of praise. Thanks for joining Dr. Michael Yusuf for Leading the Way and his powerful series, Life-Changing Prayers. If you missed any portion of today's episode, visit ltw.org. That's where you can access audio and video archives, learn more about the Leading the Way app, and get links to subscribe to the available podcasts. This program is furnished by Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef, passionately proclaiming uncompromising truth around the world. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 